Hey everybody, and you're back for the last video. You've made it almost. Um, this video is probably gonna be very little PowerPoint presentation. Most everything I'm just gonna go ahead and show you up on the whiteboard because it's a whole lot easier. Uh, so the last five videos, we've been talking about electrical. Um, one of my favorite subjects, but uh, can also be one of the most terrifying in length. Um, so it's, it's awesome once you get used to it. Now, this is where things are gonna start to get a little bit more real as far as how they apply in real life, how uh, you're gonna use a voltmeter to actually check things uh, and all that fun stuff. So uh, the first thing that I do wanna get into is the different types of circuit bolts. So, uh, things can go wrong in circuits. That's why we have a job, right? Um, if they don't go wrong, then we don't have work. Uh, so, what do we do when things do go wrong? Because customers don't just bring in their vehicle and are like, well, everything's running fine. You want to take a look at it? Most of the time, not. It's usually because they've got some sort of complaint going on with their vehicle. Uh, there are two types of circuit faults. There are circuit faults that are either going to be high resistance faults or low resistance faults. And that is going to depend on the symptoms, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the cause, and uh, that will change the symptoms. So let's talk high resistance fault. In fact, I should have just wrote that. <laughs> um, Let's talk high resistance fault first. So uh, some people will argue and say there's high resistance faults, there's low resistance faults, and there's component faults. Well, show me component that faults that's not, uh, show me component fault that's not high resistance or low resistance. Uh, so no matter what, the, the base fault is gonna be high, either high resistance or low resistance. So we've got high resistance, right? What would be an example of a high resistance fault? Well, we know that, uh, we know the resistance electrically is gonna use up voltage. So an example is going to be, and I'll use the appropriate color here. Um, number one is probably, or most commonly going to be corrosion, Urgh, corrosion. Uh, I will show you pictures uh, in upcoming presentations on what that looks like. Usually I'll try to show you in real life, um, but I don't have anything with me right now because I'm a little bit underprepared since uh, all of this was sort of sprung up on us. Um, what is corrosion? Uh, corrosion is going to be those, uh, that, the nasty little chia pets that grow on your car battery. Uh, after a long time, it's sort of this powdery, fuzzy looking material that, uh, that is usually white uh, or bluish or greenish in color. Corrosion actually uh, does do something, which is why it's a high resistance fault. It actually does use up voltage because it does do work. Corrosion uh, will actually produce heat. So there is definitely um, stuff going on. It will use up voltage. It will cause a circuit that normally parallel or normally a simple circuit into a different kind of circuit. If you remember, if I add a load in a series or in line, that now becomes a series circuit. And the more bulbs or loads I add in a series circuit, the more they have to share all of that voltage. And the problem with that is uh, things will start to get dimmer. Motors will go slower. Horns will honk lighter, um, stuff like that. So corrosion is probably the number one most common high resistance fault that you guys will see. Uh, in a circuit. The next one is super common as well. Um, not as common as our first, but it's a loose connection. Loose connections are generally bad connections, um, meaning that if I've got a whole wire that's supposed to be touching something and now maybe I've only got this much of it touching, um, that becomes a problem. Now it's sort of like uh, it's a kink in the hose. And so uh, it, it causes problems in our circuit at, in the form of high resistance, meaning it will cause things to not turn on or light bulbs to dim, motors to go slow, things like that. And then the ultimate, also common, the ultimate in high resistance is going to be an open circuit. 
Dun, dun, dun. Um, an open circuit is a circuit that has no continuity. And since we've already done the groundwork and really beat you down with what continuity is, it's that continuous path uh, for electrons to flow. When I no longer have that continuous path, we have a break in the circuit. We call that an open circuit. So if I was to draw, uh, I've got a little car battery down here. We'll just draw a simple circuit. So we've got our ground. Remember, engine, frame, chassis. Uh, we'll put in a little fuse here. We've got a little switch, normally closed, then. Uh, and one light bulb back to ground, right? If this is my circuit, any break in this circuit will be considered an open circuit. Common things that will happen in the circuit, uh, if I have a momentary spike, maybe we had a, some insulation that rubbed through and we uh, bypassed our load. I'll talk about that, that's our low resistance fault. It will create an increase in current, which will pop our fuse. And we talked about how fuses work. Well, if my fuse disconnects, do I have continuity? Do I have continuous flow throughout the entire circuit? No, I don't anymore because it's a pop fuse. If I put a new fuse in and uh, it's a whole circuit again, it's no longer open. Um, another instance could be my switch may be broke inside, right? If there's no connection, nothing can work. Uh, one of the most common, especially with light bulbs, is going to be when your light bulb filament burns out and the light bulb's just bad. Um, it now creates an open circuit as well. That would also be considered a component fault because that happened in there. Uh, if I had a loose connection or maybe a broken connection, to my ground and that no longer connects anymore. Even though I could have voltage all the way up through here, I won't use it. I'll still have voltage after because I can't drop any voltage when no work's being done because I don't have a continuous path for current flow. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm hoping that that's not super duper confusing, uh, but that's an open circuit. All of these are high resistance faults. Um, the next one I'd like to go to, and all of this is in your PowerPoint presentation that they gave you. The next one is going to be low resistance faults. And low resistance faults are easy to remember because they always start with a short. So the most common one you guys will see is a short to round. Uh, I'll explain that right now. So let me go ahead and put our ground back here. When we hear the term short, what it's really referring to is a shortcut. When you take a shortcut somewhere, where, wh wh why would you take a shortcut? Uh, let me back up there. Uh, when you take a shortcut somewhere, why do you take it? You take it because it's less work, it's less time, it's easier, right? That's a shortcut. When I'm working and somebody gives me a tip or a shortcut on how to do that same job but much easier, that's what it means. So when we hear short to ground, we need to remember that electricity is lazy. And if we give it the option to take a shortcut, it will take a shortcut. Um, so let's just go ahead and say I'll use another color here. We've got the same circuit right here, right? Power source, fuse, switch, load, and back to ground. If, uh, let's say, I rub through the insulation on this wire here, and it touched chassis ground. Well, we you know that since we've got chassis ground over here, anytime we see that symbol, it means it goes straight back to the battery, right? Well, so electricity has an option here. It's got two separate paths that we now gave it. It can either go through our circuit, and here is where it splits. It says, well, I could either go through, do work, go home, or I could not do work, go straight home and sit on the couch. I know exactly what I'm doing, and it's going to go ahead and do that. And it 
will always take the shortcut when given the opportunity. If it has the option to go back home before it does work and go and have a nice little apple juice back in the battery, then, uh, then that's what it's gonna do, always. Every single time, if it has that connection or option. That is what a short to ground is. Here's the problem. If our electricity has that option and does go straight back to ground, back to the battery, bad stuff happens, and here's why. I'm gonna bust out our handy dandy Ohm's Law pie chart again, that one that you guys love, right? We know that in our car battery, it's generally going to be 12 volts. Yeah, 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 12.6, not including charging voltage, blah, blah, blah. So that's our 12 volts. If this was a two ohm bulb before our break in the circuit, or I'm sorry, before our short in the circuit, this would have been a two ohm circuit. So we can put two ohms there. Um, with 12 divided by two, how much amps would that give us? That would give us a total of six amps throughout the circuit, right? Not that crazy. But now that we've created a shortcut, the resistance in this circuit changes. Since electricity no longer has to go through this anymore, it says screw that, I'm not going to do work, and it goes straight back to the battery. Well, my fuse doesn't have any resistance. My switch doesn't have any resistance. I don't have any resistance in this circuit at all. We have zero ohms. That's a problem. So what happens? Those of you who are experienced, you know, well, a fuse pops. That's why that happens. Uh, if I had no fuse in the circuit, what would happen? Flames, flames would happen. A fire would start because electricity, again, is that two-year-old that you didn't give anything to do, so it's gonna find something destructive to do while nobody's watching. Uh, and now this wire is on fire, and so is the rest of your car. And if it's a BMW, good luck. Uh, the fire department will come and maybe pop some popcorn or roast some hot dogs with you, uh, but they're not gonna be able to do this to put that out. Uh, these are as magnesium blocks. So this is our problem. And to prevent this fire from happening, we put in the fuse. So when a short to ground happens, almost always, always our fuse will pop. And this is to protect the circuit. So if you are trying to diagnose a circuit and you pop in a fuse and it pops, pop in another fuse, stupid AutoZone fuses suck. Um, they always break, pops another fuse. Damn, these really suck. I'm gonna go to O'Reilly's and get me some more fuses that are quality. Uh, you pop in O'Reilly fuse and it pops. Because it's not the fuses that are the problem, it's a short to ground that's the problem. And you need to find out where the short to ground is um, before you can actually start to diagnose it. So some things you can do is uh, look at the situation. As soon as I put a new fuse in, does it pop? If not, let me grab my marker here. Let's say I put a new fuse in and it doesn't pop. But as soon as I close the switch, it pops. Well, what does that tell me? It tells me anything after my switch to the light bulb is going to be, I'm sorry, to the load, whatever it might be in the circuit, is the, the problem. If I put in a new fuse and instantly it pops, then that means my problem is then before my switch. So there are some things you can look at to help narrow it down. Uh, there's also some things you can do, like use a test light or, or an incandescent light bulb actually would be even best. Um, if I wire that in instead of my fuse, then as long as the short circuit is there, the light bulb will turn on um, in place of my fuse. But as soon as I find the short, the light bulb will turn off. Rather than having to go through a million fuses and pop them, um, you need to give it a load so it, it doesn't have too much of a spike in amperage. So that is what a short to ground is. Short to ground will always pop a fuse. I'm pretty sure that's a test question. 
too. Probably was a home, homework question. So make sure, hopefully y'all are watching this video too before the end of the week um, for your end of module quiz. But that's a short to grab. There is one more type of low resistance fault. Uh, this one's always super fun to diagnose. It's always really hard for me to not laugh when customers come in with this next one. The last one is called a short to voltage. And this generally means that two circuits are crossing when they're not supposed to. Remember I talked about splices and wires that are not connected? Well, what happens is I've got wires that are not connected, but maybe run next to each other or across each other, and maybe they rubbed against each other, or they were under something heavy that cut them, or they chafed, whatever it might be, they now make a connection. So let's say everything runs off of our 12 volt battery, right? And let's say I've got, let me make room here. I've got my switch for my, uh, let's say my brake lights. And since by law, I have to have three brake lights. I'll go ahead and draw a little baby third brake light in there. And coming off as well, we've got tons of other circuits that it could be, right? But I'll just draw another one. Let's say coming off here, I've got another circuit. That is, actually, I know I'll draw this one a little bit above it to make it easier. Um, I've got another circuit that comes off, and um, we'll say, goes through here, here's my switch, and we'll say this is my horn circuit. Horns look like a little horn, right? Um, if I drew this correctly, I would have drawn that little hump over. They are not connected, right? They are not connected. Um, what I have had come in is customers will come in saying that every single time they step on their brakes, the horn will honk. That's because somewhere in the circuit where the wires are together, they chafed. And now they're making a splice or connection. So every time I close my horn switch, I give power to my brake lights. Or every time I give power to my brake lights, I give power to my horn. Um, that is a short to voltage. Now I will tell you, what. look at the circuit here. What did we do? We've got power source come through, uh, and then it branches off to different light bulbs. All that we did is add another branch. So we made another branch to a parallel circuit. Here's the problem with that. So sometimes the only problem is just things come on when I don't want them to come on. That might be the only problem. Other times you might have a fuse pop, and here's why. Remember back to where uh, a few videos ago I talked about parallel circuits, and uh, the, the more branches you add, the more lanes you add to that freeway? That's what we're looking at. We just added another lane. Therefore, we will actually get more current flow and that will spike up, and sometimes that can cause a fuse to pop. Sometimes, not always. Short to ground, always pop a fuse. Uh, short to voltage, sometimes pop a fuse, depending on the circuit and what uh, branch was added. Now, some of you guys might be thinking, what happens if I get a ground accidentally after the bolt? Nothing. You don't have a customer that comes in and complains of that, because there's no fault here. It's something that we call a redundant ground. Um, and all it is is adding a ground after the load, which we were doing anyway. So it's not really going to affect the customer uh, in any way. So most of the time you find those on accident when you're looking for something else. Um, but those are your faults. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about briefly before we get into DVOMs is your conversions and how you're going to convert your measurements. So if I am going to, uh, you know what, let's talk DVOMs first. We'll talk DVOMs first because um, conversions will make a whole lot more sense afterward. So DVOMs or digital volt ohmmeters look like this. DVOMs or digital volt ohmmeters are how you are going to measure things and you should get yourself a decent DVOM 
because these are going to be probably one of your most useful tools that will help you make some money um, in diagnosing. So your meter, and this is an older one, this is a 115, it's kind of a cheaper one, so it has less controls, but it's what I got at home, so um, bear with me here. On the other side, or down here at the bottom, you can see there's holes here, so I'm gonna show you up here. You do have pictures in your PowerPoint presentation. The one I'm, I'm holding in front of you is a Fluke. Uh, Fluke is probably one of the top brands that makes DVOMs. Um, I'd say they're the best thing for your buck. You can spend as little as uh, 50 bucks on a meter and it can go all the way through hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So um, what we're looking at here is our adjustment dial, right, off. Uh, we have some voltage settings. Um, we have ohms. We have a couple uh, different ones here. That's a diode. Um, we've got continuity tester here. And here's our amperage. Real quick before I get into anything, I want you to notice the difference between voltage uh, here and voltage here. Notice one is a squiggly line while the other is a dotted line. Real quick before I um, move along here, this is something that's really important. If you ever see a squiggly line on top of a measurement like that or a dotted line, that tells you whether or not your meter is in either the setting for AC or the setting for oops, DC. AC is going to be alternating current, and this is not your PowerPoint, so I just feel like it's, it's necessary to talk about. Alternating current, and DC is going to be direct current. Um, and don't let the symbols fool you. It's not really what it's referring to uh, as far as wave signs. Alternating current, um, and, and let me go ahead and actually just add on to our picture here. Alternating current means that if I had a number or, or a line, let's say that this is zero volts, right? Uh, up here is one volt and down here is negative one volt. Alternating current means that, uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and just color code that, alternating current can be red. It means that it alternates between positive and negative. Now, this could be a squiggly line. This could be a square wave. Doesn't matter. It just means that it goes both ways. So we've got uh, positive and negative, positive and negative. Um, it's sort of rare in the vehicle what, uh, what signals, or, or I'm sorry, it's sort of rare that you will see alternating signals, um, your alternator, obviously, but it uses diodes to rectify that signal to back to DC. Um, but if we're looking at DC, instead, DC is direct current, meaning, uh, meaning that, and I'll color code this one blue, DC stays positive, whether it's a square wave or whether it's a sine wave. It never ventures down into the negative side. So that's just something to think about when you're measuring. If you accidentally measure using the wrong one, you're going to get bad readings. So if I put my meter to measure DC volts, it's going to give me the average reading on the screen. There's a problem if I am measuring something that has an AC signal, because if it's going positive one, negative one, positive one, negative one, the average of positive one and negative one is going to be zero volts. So it's just going to show you zero volts. So make sure you're on the correct setting for that one. Super duper important. So if you're going to measure volts on a vehicle, you're generally going to measure it using DC volts. Same with your amperage as well. Now you can see these yellow symbols here. These yellow symbols here um, only are activated by our yellow button. I'm not gonna get into all the functions here. I do just wanna get into a couple of things that I'm gonna turn on our backlight. Down here, you can see that there are different holes in the meter. So we've got one that says, you might not be able to see it because the light volts and ohms. In the middle, we've got a black one that says COM, and on the other side, we've got one that just says A. Um, what you're gonna wanna do is, depending on what you're measuring, uh, you will connect it to whatever it is that you're measuring. 
So I need you guys to do me a favor. For right now, you want to stay out of the <laughs> you're gonna to want to stay out of the a hole for uh, the moment until you decide that you're gonna measure amps. Um, for right now, um, let me try to get the other side of our lead. So our meter is generally going to come with these leads that have wires on them. And if you look close, they've got these little pins on them. You should have used them in Auto 50, um, but just in case. On the other side of those leads, they have little connections, like little banana connections. Obviously, they are color coded. So I can go in the A hole for amps, or I can go in the V hole for, uh, for voltage, or ohms if I'm measuring ohms, because that symbol is there too. Um, I do want to tell you here, if I can find it, the black clip is always going to go in the com or common ground terminal. Don't uh, mix those up. It, it, it'll just give you a backwards reading um, if you don't color code them correctly. Um, but if here, here's the reason why I was mentioning earlier. If I'm measuring volts, the way I'm going to hook up my meter is very specific. Uh, and I need you guys to know that in between COM and V, there is uh, 10 million ohms, lots of ohms. So if I put this across a battery, I'm not short, short circuiting anything. This has plenty of ohms. Here's the problem. Between the A or amps hole and the COM terminal, I have zero. So if I have my meter hooked up into the amps terminal, in the COM terminal and I hook this across a battery, I simply created a short circuit and you will let the magic smoke out of our fluke meter here uh, or your meter at home. So don't do that. You definitely want to uh, make sure you're in the correct hole. Most of the time if I'm on the volt scale and I accidentally put this in the wrong hole, oh, the meter's not gonna yell at me. Sometimes it'll make noise. Uh, let's try, no. Nicer meters or more modern meters will actually just beep at you. So if the meter's beeping at you, check your connections and compare them to your dial because something doesn't match up. It's trying to keep you from destroying the meter. So um, there's a couple of different tests you can do with the digital volts on meters. The first one I'm going to talk about is voltage tests. Get rid of that here. So there's two types of ways you can hook up a meter. Uh, one is going to be called available Oops. voltage, and the other one is going to be voltage drop. Um, I'm going to go ahead and draw our circuit up here. I'll draw a bulb. And I'm going to draw my meter. Um, I will use green since I don't have yellow. We'll say my meter like the one I showed you, got a little screen, a little dial. We're going to go ahead and set this sucker to volts DC or dotted line. And I'm going to have two leads. So the first way I can hook up the meter is going to be available voltage. Uh, the black lead can go anywhere on chassis ground. No big deal. It can go on the battery negative. It can go anywhere on chassis ground as long as it's bare metal. The red lead that's coming from our voltage terminal is going to go anywhere I want to know where I, I want to know what voltage is. So what is the available voltage at any given point? If I want to know how much voltage is before my fuse, what should it be? Have we used up any voltage yet if this is a 12 volt system? No. So it should be 12 volts. What about after the fuse, as long as everything's working correctly? It should still be 12 volts. Uh, coming out of my switch, if the switch is closed, if it's open, we won't see anything. But if the switch is closed, it's not doing any work, it's just simply transferring voltage, I should still see 
12 volts. I should see 12 volts going into my load. Now, once I go to check available voltage after, am I allowed any voltage after the battery? Mm -mm. So anything after the load, I should see zero volts. If I see anything, that means we're saving voltage to do work somewhere. Maybe I've got some corrosion down here. Um, so if I saw two or three volts, I know something else is wrong. So that's an available voltage test. Voltage drop tests are going to look similar, but a little bit different. So if I am doing a voltage drop step, so available voltage is voltage at any given point. Voltage drop is how much voltage is dropping across a particular component. In order to know, I need to have a lead in front of and behind whatever it is that I'm testing. So if I'm testing, uh, we'll say, if I wanna know how much voltage is being used, oh, we'll say across this bulb, I'm going to put a lead in front of the bulb and I'm going to take a lead and I'm gonna put it after the bulb. Well, we know from our previous test that we've got 12 volts coming in and zero volts coming out. What our volt meter does, and no, no matter how you hook it up, what our volt meter does is it will read the difference between each lead. What is the difference between one lead and the other? So if we look at this here, I know I've got 12 volts coming into the bowl, so I should see 12 volts at the red lead. And I do know, since we already tested, that I've got zero volts coming out of my bulb here. So my black lead would see zero volts, and my voltmeter is going to read the difference between 12 and zero. Make sense? So if it sees that it's got 12 volts coming in and zero volts coming out, I am going to get a meter that reads 12 volts because I've got it hooked up to read voltage drop. So that's something that's important. And here's why, because right now that seems all hunky-dory. But in another situation, you might not know if a reading is correct or not, depending on how you hooked it up. What if I want to know how much voltage is being used across that switch? I would hook up one lead on one side, and I'd hook up my other lead on the other. And again, it's reading the difference between these two points. So what we're looking at here, you know that as long as everything's working properly, I've got 12 volts coming in. Is the switch doing any work? It's not supposed to be. So I shouldn't have any voltage drop happening and I should have 12 volts coming out, which we already tested previously on this. Well, if I've got 12 volts coming in and I've got 12 volts coming out, then what will my, read, my meter read? It will read the difference between 12 and 12. Is there a difference between 12 and 12? No. So my meter is going to read zero volts. And if you don't understand how you hooked up the meter, you're like, oh, there's my problem. I've got no voltage. No, you do. The difference in 12 and 12 is zero. That's why it's reading zeros because you're doing a voltage drop test, not an available voltage test. So that's just something you really want to think about uh, when you're checking for voltage across anything. And um, I'll talk about uh, I'll talk about some some other tests with with voltage later on. So that is how you would hook up a voltmeter in either available voltage or voltage drop. In the PowerPoint presentation I gave you, it does say uh, to hook it up in parallel. So when I hooked up my meter here, I gave electricity uh, option to travel different routes. I added a branch onto my circuit. So that's parallel. Um, I can test uh, anything for amperage as well. So here's how this would look. I would have my meter. The most important thing to know about amperage, and it, it shows, so on my amperage, I've, I've got to set my meter to amps, and I'm now going to take it out of the V hole, and I'm going to put it into the A hole, and um, the black goes in common, as usual. We'll go ahead and put our meter into the other side where it says A. And uh, if I want to measure amperage, here's the thing. If I hook it up like I did the voltmeter, Electrons can either go through here or can go through here. The problem is, is that this has no resistance when it is on the amps setting in the angle 
So uh, you really want to be careful there because you might create a short circuit. If you hook it up, like an available voltage test, you simply created a short circuit and you will blow up the meter or blow the fuse in the meter. So you need to hook up ammeters. Let me get rid of this because this is confusing here. Ammeters always need to be hooked up. This is actually extra confusing because I left this here. Amperage. Uh, meter always needs to be hooked up in series. And we know from before that series means that we're forcing electricity to go through one path. And that's what we're going to have to do if we want to measure uh, amperage. What most of the time you will do, uh, the easiest way to perform amperage test in a circuit is actually to remove the fuse um, and hook up our meter that way. So what we'll do is we'll connect one lead from the battery and then the other lead will be coming out. So we're sort of using the ammeter as a fuse. Here's the problem. Any systems that have uh, fuses any higher than 10 amps, or I'm sorry, any circuits that have any higher amperage flow than 10 amps, your meter could potentially blow. Uh, if there's an amperage spike, it's not likely, but if there's an amperage spike, your meter may blow um, and it can't handle more than that amperage. So uh, you need to be careful. What I like to use is I'll use a fuse jumper lead in here that is rated lower than my meter, maybe 7.5 or 10, depending on what your meter is rated at. Uh, but you wanna be careful. They do make ammeters that uh, they're called amp clamps and it sort of just wraps around a wire some are more sensitive than others. What's really cool about those is they're called inductive leads. Uh, induction actually means that, uh, it, induction is referring to the magnetic field that a wire that has current running through it produces. Every wire that has any current running through it produces a little magnetic field around it. The higher the current, the stronger the magnetic field. So what's really nice about amp clamps is they'll just clamp around a wire and it measures that magnetic field and will determine the amperage based upon that. So um, amp clamps are really the way to go if you can afford it. They're just a little pricey. Um, but ammeters must be hooked up in series. I can't emphasize that enough. If you screw that up, you will blow up the meter. So, um, and right now it's not the school's meter, it's your own meter. So be extra careful about that. Lastly, I wanna talk about uh, how you would test for ohms. So ohms, you can have no power to the component. And here's the reason why. Our ohm meter, same meter, the only difference is that we've got a dial here And that dial is then gonna be set to ohms rather than volts or amps. Uh, the com is gonna go in the black terminal. And then we're gonna go back to the V hole because right next to V it actually shows an ohm symbol. So um, here's the thing. In order to determine how much resistance something has, the way our meter does that is it actually sends out a current and sees what comes back. So if we're looking at this here, let's say this is my lead and this is my lead. If I was to say put a piece of wire between those two leads, my own meter is going to send out a small current, pass it through and see how much uh, pressure comes back. And it will tell me how much resistance is in there. If it's just a piece of wire, it may just be zero ohms, right? Um, so with that, uh, it's its own power source. Well, our car already has a power source. So bad things can happen to the meter if we've got competing power sources. So what you must do is you must isolate the component from power, either disconnect the battery or just take it out of the circuit. So in this case, what we would do is we would remove our light bulb if we want to test the light bulb. And I would put my light bulb down here. 
and I would test across my light bulb here. And maybe it would tell me that there's six ohms across that light bulb, whatever it might be, right? And then I can put it back. Here's why ohmmeters really don't work well, is when they send out a current and a voltage, it's very, very little. So it would be the equivalent of sending a motorcycle down the highway during traffic hour to see how bad traffic is. Well, motorcycles can zoom straight through lanes, right? So uh, it's not a very good way of checking. If you really wanted to check traffic, you would send a full car, right? So that's kind of why ohm meters suck because they are not a full-fledged battery that's gonna send the amount of current that is normally through that circuit. So what test is best? Amps, not a great test, and here's why. You have no idea what it's supposed to be. Most of your specifications are not going to be how much amps are going through a circuit. And so you're like, okay, cool, I've got 10 amps. Is that good, is that bad? Am I supposed to have more? Am I not supposed to have that much? So you have no idea what you're really comparing it to. The best test, if you can, if at ever possible, is going to be your voltage test available and voltage drop. As long as you know what you're looking at and you know what you should see on the meter, which you always should. If you're going to hook up a meter to something you know, you always need to ask yourself, what, what should this be? Should this be 12? Should I see 12 volts or, or should I not see 12 volts? Should it have dropped by now? It's not 12 volts is not always good. Sometimes it should have dropped by then. Um, sometimes it is okay. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that's sort of tough. Um, but voltage is really the most dynamic, the best test that you could possibly um, perform. Sometimes you don't have an option because whatever it is that you're testing is buried deep into something or is moving while the vehicle is, is using it. So sometimes you must do an own test. Um, you, the least commonly used is going to be your current or amperage test, uh, but we will use that this semester for, uh, for uh, amperage draw tests um, and what we call parasitic load. So um, that is how you use a digital volt ohm meter. We are almost done, I promise. <laughs> now that you know how to use the meter and you know where you put it in the circuit and how you're gonna hook it up, there's one last thing that we need to discuss um, because the number you might see might not be the number you think it is on the meter. So I'm gonna just briefly show you uh, conversions. And some of you guys might already know this, so you can sort of skip this portion if this is all basic and easy to you. Uh, but let's say I wanted to convert, I'll say, um, let's just say 12 volts. Uh, your meter may not show whatever the voltage is. There is also um, kilo volts. There is also, on the other side of things, milli volts. I don't wanna get really into mega or micro quite yet. I just wanna keep this pretty basic. Um, sometimes you're working with really high numbers, sometimes you're not. So really what we're looking at here is going to be a conversion. Uh, I like to call the chart the STD chart and not for any reason that you might think, STD is gonna stand for standard, the standard unit of measurement. Um, and that is going to be at its base, volts, amps, or ohms. If you're talking about measuring liquids, your standard unit of measure is gonna be liters um, or displacement. Um, in this case, it is, we're, we're looking at volts, amps, or ohms, right? And this chart makes it really easy because it's showing a decimal point. So if I take my decimal point, we'll say if a number doesn't show the decimal point, it's always going to be at the end of the number, unless it's 12.5 and then you know where the decimal point is. On this chart, if I move my decimal point exactly one, two, three places to the left, it will give me whatever the kilo number is, whether that's kilovolts, kiloamps, or kilo ohms. If I move my decimal point over to the right three decimal places, 
then I am going to get little m or milli volts, milli amps, milli ohms. And this is really important um, because if we're talking resistance, you're like, oh, I've only got 12, 12 ohms. Are you sure it's not 12 kilo ohms? Because that's a big difference. Um, or 12 milli ohms. Those are very, very different numbers. So let's just do a quick a couple of examples on how you would uh, set that up here. Let's just say I've got my original number of 12 volts. What if I wanted to turn that into milli volts? All I need to do is take my number. I know that since I don't see a decimal point, it's automatically at the end. And since we're at volts, we're starting at our standard unit of measure. It's volts. Not anything but just volts. Now, if I want to go to milli volts, then I need to figure out where I'm gonna move my decimal points. And on my chart, if I've got my handy dandy STD charts, then I know that milli is to the right. So I'm gonna take my decimal point, and I am going to move it one, two, three to the right. And I'm gonna put in my placeholders here. And now that number goes from a very small number to a very large number because it's a very small unit of measurement. Milli volts is uh, 12 volts is gonna equal 12,000 millivolts. <coughs> Rona, uh, 12,000 millivolts is not a very big number. It sounds like it's big, but it's really not because it's millivolts, right? What if I wanted to take that same number though instead and convert it to kilovolts? I'd do the same thing, but to the opposite side. So I've got K, V, um, I got my decimal point. And in this case, if I want to go from my standard unit of measure volts to kilo volts, I know that instead my decimal point needs to move one, two, three places to the left, which is going to give me 0 0.012 kilo volts, which seems like a very tiny number. All of those are the same though. 0 0.012 kilo volts, uh, 12,000 millivolts, or 12 volts, it's all the same. It's simply converting it from one unit of measure to the other. So um, the way I like to remember this, and if anybody comes up with something better, please tell me because this is super lame. Um, but the only thing I can use to remember is Kelly stayed mad. If you can remember that Kelly stayed mad, I'm sorry, if anybody out there's name is Kelly, I, I apologize. Maybe you're not mad all the time, but according to my SDD chart, you are mad all the time. <coughs> Kelly stayed mad. If you can remember that, then you know which side the K goes on and which side the little M goes on. So this is the easiest way to convert. I'm gonna throw a few up on here, and I'm gonna have you guys just sort of, uh, now that you know the chart, Kelly stayed mad. I'm gonna throw up a few numbers up here. I'm gonna go ahead and throw up, let's say, how many uh, milli ohms is 80 ohms? We'll go with uh, 260 volts into kilo volts. And then let's do one more. Ooh, this one would be crazy. 2.5 kiloamps to how many amps? So I'm gonna give you guys a few minutes here. I'd like you to pause the video. I'd like you to try to do these on your own. And then when you come back, I will show you the answers. So pause. Okay, so you should have paused the video. And now we're back, I'm gonna show you uh, using our STD chart, so we've got standard volts, uh, ohms, amps, and to the left we have, remember Kelly, stay, and to the right we've got Matt. So if I've got 80 ohms, just ohms is my standard unit of measure, so I'm going to take my invisible decimal point and I'm going to go to Matt or milli. So I'm going to go from standard to milli. That means I go to the right three places. That is going to give me 80,000 milli ohms. Crazy number, right? But it's the same. Doesn't matter. It's exact same. 
uh, volts to kilovolts. So we're going from standard unit of measure again, my decimal decimal point, to kilovolts. So we're going to take it to the left. The correct answer here would be 0.26 kilovolts. And down here, 2.5 kiloamps. That doesn't sound like a whole lot of amps, right? It seems safe enough. If we want to go from kilo all the way to standard, I'm going to take my decimal point and I'm going to move it three places to the right, which is going to give me 2,500 amps with enough voltage behind it is plenty enough to fry you. So this is where conversions really come in handy, especially when you get into hybrid vehicles, but we'll talk more about that when you get to Auto 95. Um, so this is how you do conversions. That's how you use a multimeter and different types of circuit faults. Thank you guys so much for bearing with me. I really feel like I blew through everything. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Don't forget to do your unit quiz on Thursday. You'll have all day to do it, but it must be due uh, by midnight on Thursday, technically Friday. Um, but do your homework first. Uh, you just now finished watching all of the lecture videos. Um, and uh, do your homework, do your homework because it's gonna help you. And I'm not collecting homework, I am simply taking your results from your quiz for your grade at this moment. So thank you guys for hanging in there. Again, please ask questions if you have them. All right, see you next week.